And we have our next speaker. This is Alexis Boyce from uh, Communication Research Center in Canada. Communication Research uh, Center in Canada, speaking about wireless USRP backhaul network, uh, geolocating GPS jammers in near real time. So uh, I'll hand it off. Thank you very much. Hello. Thanks for coming to listen to this talk. Uh, it's been a long time coming. I've done this presentation many times, but never to a technical audience who would appreciate the fine details. Uh, I work for the Communication Research Center Canada. Um, we are a government federal laboratory. We advise the uh, uh, efficient use of radio spectrum. Uh, we give long-term technical advice uh, for spectrum management and regulation and policy. Uh, we support critical wireless uh, uh, comms for operational requirements, and we do uh, uh, R&D collaborations. Uh, to leverage our research. Um, long term means about 10 years out, and so what we do is uh, show what is possible, and we uh, report back saying where things are going and how the spectrum could be better regulated and all those uh, type of rules that they said that they this morning that we spoke a bit about. We give some input to that, and sometimes they listen, sometimes they don't. So what is a jammer? So a GPS jammer is an active device that you can buy for about 15 bucks on eBay or wherever. It's uh, made offshore. And typically, it's just a sweeping tone. So it's CW that's just sweeping on the GPS band. And so there you can see the, uh, the frequency. It's just a sweeping tone. And that's a chirp in this case, which is the most common one that we've seen. So it just goes up, comes back down, goes up, comes back down. So why are they used is the, the typical question that people ask. Um, and the first answer I give uh, in Canada, as well here, I believe, truckers are regulated. They're only allowed to work a certain hours a month. <clears throat> and because it becomes a public safety problem if they're on the highway too much. So they plug in a GPS jammer into their truck to mess up the, uh, the tracker on the truck. And uh, then they can get more hours. So they're just trying to work more hours. And they're not uh, educated or nobody really knows what the effect is of the jammer. And the, the, the sad truth is that the jammer actually propagates pretty far. And these offshore places where they're made, they don't really care about the power. They're just happy that they're jamming the, the jammer signal. So nobody's optimized. And what we've seen is that they can propagate pretty uh, very far, uh, as we'll see later. So the other side of the story is that uh, with seizures of drugs, guns, and jammers, jammers do show up on regular seizures of uh, organized crime. So there are multiple. Uh, people using them for multiple reasons. So why is uh, GPS so vulnerable? Uh, the uh, GPS signal is like a light bulb in space in the MEO uh, Earth orbit, so not LEO MEO. So that's pretty far. And uh, we receive it at about a minus 120 dBm. So that is very low, and anything can perturb it. So it is fragile. It's good. It gives us lots of information. But we need to protect the band and be sure it's clean for things to work. So what is the big deal? Um, our critical infrastructure in Canada is about the similar as yours. There's about 10 critical infrastructure. Um, it typically affects transport, but also energy. Um, the uh, father of GPS, Bradford Parkinson, has, also, has mentioned on numerous occasions that he wished the word GPS wasn't just global positioning system. He wished that there was T in there for timing, because very critical infrastructure use it for timing, as you can see here. So a boat that's entry into port has uh, need, uh, the minimum uh, space requirement is 2.5 meters. If it doesn't have it, it's going to hit something, or the port's going to operate non-optimally. So uh, if you translate that, it's about 7.5 nanoseconds. So if you get a, any perturbance into that, you're going to have issues with your boats going into port. Internet time, PTP, requires 20 nanoseconds as a reference station, and everyone's using a GPS for that. Uh, on planes, they use comms, and their comms on the planes is 40 nanoseconds. Uh, ADSB, which is the beacons that planes say, hey, I'm here, I'm here, this is my, my coordinates, that whole reference system is 30 nanoseconds. And th 50 nanoseconds for, is for the electrical grid. They uh, reserve the right to uh, analyze phase, because phase, is, phase transmission optimizes the efficient transmit of power. Now, 50 nanoseconds is used upon occasion, but not very much. So I was naive when I, uh, when I wrote this slide. I didn't think we'd ever see anything past 50 nanoseconds. We're blown way past 100 nanoseconds. So at that point, telecom starts getting affected past 100 nanoseconds. So these are transient uh, um, events as in a car will go by. So that's why you don't see critical infrastructure just shutting down left and right. That's one question I get. Why don't we see more disasters? 
But we have seen truckers that uh, don't turn off their trucks and they're close to the runway in Canada, they had to shut down the runway. We've seen ports not, opt uh, not operate optimally because there's a jammer for a week that they couldn't find and boats, you know, the, the, the traffic had to slow down. So this is a big deal and it's, every, it's everywhere in all uh, industrialized countries. We're reporting about the same amount of uh, jammer activity, if you will. So where I work, we've been looking at this since 2011. Uh, in 2011, uh, on the highway where I'm from in Ottawa, a uh, million people, one major highway, so standard traffic. For three weeks, they got about two or four jammers a day. In Montreal, they did the same thing. They got three to four jammers per day over two weeks. In this case, they were just sampling randomly. There was no intelligence. It was just saying, okay, every five seconds, we're just going to see what's out there. Um, now we have a system that's up a tower 300 meters away from the highway, and it's monitoring 24-7, and we're getting about five to eight events a day. So they're there and uh, we know what 30% of these are. Those are the chirp jammers. We can identify 70% we still haven't looked into. Um, the GNSS, so that stands for Global Navigation uh, Satellite Systems, comprising GPS, GLONASS, Galileo. Uh, this is just a slide to say there's a lot of money uh, being backed by these systems. 4.1 trillion Canadian, 80% of that is 3 point something uh, trillion uh, American. So we're in the trillions, it's a big deal. Um, this uh, slide is just the um, the chip, the chip revenue. So it's not services. So here, uh, LBS is location-based services. So it's the chips that they forecast uh, that will be the demand to give uh, location-based services. So this is just the idea of who's using it. Looks like everybody, and it's a big deal to industry. So we uh, joined with NavCan, Navigation Canada, that does all the air traffic control in Canada. Uh, because they've seen these uh, planes on approach uh, and planes on takeoff have lost GPS. They're not supposed to fly with GPS. That's another whole political story. But uh, they have seen it, so they say, yeah, it's a problem. Let's, let's see if we can do something about it. So uh, this project, uh, we were to demonstrate in near real time the geolocation of a GPS jammer using the TDOA, the standard method that other people have mentioned here. Uh, leverage previous experience uh, and uh, demonstrate a low cost and that's very, very key as we'll see. Field deployable, also causing more uh, requirement problems, uh, spectrum monitoring application. So here's the system diagram we're gonna spend a little bit of time on. Um, ask questions, I guess, if you're confused initially. So there are two systems that were made, the CRC GPS iGeoLock for interference geolocation. That will tell you where the interference is, but it doesn't know if you have a problem. And then on the bottom left is CRC GPS aware. Now the GPS aware doesn't know that you have interference, but it knows that you have a problem. So the first thing that we did is uh, we were invited by the, on the campus where I'm at, there's defense research. They go every so often to a military range. They have the license to jam. So we hopped on board, we did all that. And it's not conducive to research at all because they have a schedule. They control the jammer. Many people want to know what's going on. The, the jammer goes all over the place. It's very hard to, to do iterative testing. So I said, uh, you know, we can't work here. So I came up with an idea of, well, why don't we just get a jammer? And we did get one from our RCMP, which is equivalent to your FBI. And uh, they gave us one, and we still couldn't transmit it in the GPS band, even if for the government, it's illegal. So I decided to say, okay, let's translate the band. Let's move it to an adjacent band. So that's what we have here. We got a jammer, and we put it in a, a van, and we translated the band uh, to a nearby band that we had a license for. And so that's what we call the uh, GPS translated jammer or pseudo jammer. So this box down here where I have the mouse is uh, sending out the jamming frequency and he is being picked up by four sensing nodes, which we'll see. Now the sensing nodes are a USRP, which is a B200. And in fact, they're two B200s because the tuning offset is more than what one would allow. And it is controlled, if you look here, Raspberry Pi. So Raspberry Pi, most people would think, how can a Raspberry Pi run a USRP? The data rate can't handle it. And it's not even the new Raspberry Pi, it's the previous version. So the, the trick is it's an analog loopback. So the data, which we'll see in a sec, it actually gets picked up, uh, it's received. So one USRP is listening to the jamming frequency and in the FPGA sends it back out, uh, there's a RF loopback, I should say, and sends it back out the backhaul frequency. So the Raspberry Pi does nothing but do the configuration over Wi-Fi. So that's how the uh, a sensing node is kept cheap and it, how it uh, moves its data. It's just an RF loopback. 
So once it picks up the signal, it sends it out over the backhaul frequency. Um, oh, I should also mention that the Raspberry Pi is connected to a spherical uh, mirror called the bubble scope. And that just takes a panoramic photo. Uh, in this case, it's every second. So that puts a uh, just geographic context into your geolocation. So it's great to have a, a point on the map, but you don't know what's going on. So the whole idea is you tell enforcement, OK, look, we're looking for this type of car or vehicle. So each of these four sensing nodes has a dedicated piece of backhaul frequency. And I guess at this point, I should mention that the GPS band is 20 megahertz. And initially, I tried to push 20 megahertz through a backhaul band, and it got messy pretty quickly. So I ended up just using 5 megahertz. And 5 megahertz is all you need to resolve the timing in, in the GPS. So each of these four sensing nodes is sending back 5 megahertz of uh, GPS uh, or jamming frequency that uh, is being sent on the, on the uh, backhaul frequency. That is then received by the uh, processing node, which is another USRP, the X300, with the SBX daughter card. And that is uh, doing uh, four digital down converters, because down conversions in the FPGA, because there are four sensing nodes, and uh, bring it down to a TDOA uh, processing server. And at the same time, we have a, uh, the standalone, or the GPS aware. So he is actually using a Trimble GPS timing receiver. And he's receiving the jamming frequency uh, at the translated band. And the difference here is that he is actually receiving real GPS. He's retransmitting the GPS at the translated band. The jamming frequency is coming in the air, and it's mixing in the air. And then he's taking that back in and feeding it into a GPS uh, receiver, uh, upconverted. And so the GPS receiver then has a GPS frequency that also has the jamming frequency involved. So the trick here was that I discovered by accident was if you feed the pulse per second of a GPS receiver into a CSAC, which is a chip scale atomic clock, and you keep the chip scale atomic clock in this mode where it just uses its phase detector, every, sec uh, every uh, pulse per second you will, you will get the nanosecond error in that pulse per second. And so that's how we deduce that we have a timing error. So this is in line, in real time, hardware, solution, and a lot of atomic clock people don't agree, but I am not using the atomic clock. <laughs> I'm using the phase detector within it, so we'll hope to avoid that discussion. So the one thing I didn't mention is that we also have a, a Wi-Fi network, so that Wi-Fi network uh, controls everybody. I guess I should go to the, the control network here. So here, everything in orange is highlighted. Um, so yeah, this is just how we configure the whole network. Uh, this is The idea is there's a control network. And there's a data network. So the data network is separate. There's no interaction. And the data network is hard real time. We're just looping back uh, the RF spectrum. And it's being received continuously in the X300. So finally, the question should be, uh, well, like the other DOA um, discussions we've had this morning, uh, how, do we, how do we calibrate this stuff? And how do we synchronize this stuff? And that was one of the hardest problems. In, when you're in GPS, usually everyone uses GPS to synchronize things. But if I'm jammed, how do I use GPS? So I can't. So how do you get these uh, B200s located uh, 500 meters away uh, around uh, an area that's with trees that we'll see the demonstration for? How do you get them calibrated? So um, the designer of the B200 I should thank profusely because they put a PLL chip in front of that reference. And that PLL chip allowed a reference to go from 5 megahertz to about 105. And that saved me. So I started looking in my ISM book, OK, what bands are free between that? And I found 27 megahertz, which is a CB radio band. So the place I work at, they've been doing RF stuff for many years. And so went to the basement, dug out some HF equipment. I don't, I'm an FPGA guy, so this is all new to me. So I uh, managed to put up a half wave uh, 20 mega, 27 megahertz antenna and pump out a CW. So four watt uh, CW pumping out continuously. And uh, yeah, we received that at all four stations, at all four nodes, and it was a pain. We had to use cavity filters and try to make it clean, but all four nodes managed to receive that signal. So that makes all the nodes frequency locked, but we still have this problem of phase locked. How do you, how do you phase lock them? So. Uh, the B200 also, thanks to analog devices, put a, a, a white noise or a pseudo-random uh, byte generator in the front. So one node will just shoot out the, uh, will, will just transmit, and the other nodes will receive. And I know where that node is, so I receive it. I do the TDOA. I'm off. OK, well, that error, as we'll see the equations, that's the offset. So that's how you phase synchronize. 
So this is a wireless phase synchronization method. Uh, I wouldn't say it's the best method, but it works. So the GPS translated uh, jammer setup. Uh, so this is just on top of the van. So we're just transmitting. Uh, we, it's on magnets, so we could put it on the hood, and we could put it anywhere. Uh, the GPS position uh, would record the actual position of the van, and the Wi-Fi client was just so the van was, was uh, part of the network, so we could see where it is, as we'll see in the demo shortly. So this is just an example, the uh, system diagram of the sensing node. So once again, it's the interference geolocator sensing node. Uh, so we, uh, we receive a, uh, uh, the jammer frequency here, I called it alpha. Uh, oh, sorry, we receive L1, uh, the GPS, and we transmit it out at alpha, and then we uh, receive the alpha and transmit it out the backhaul frequency down here. So, and the backhauls are, we'll see the spectrum analyzer in the demo, they're all, uh, so it's frequency dedicated to each one of them. So this is what a sensing node looks like, and I put snow to make you guys remember I'm from Canada. <laughs> and we bring snow pants to work, and uh, gotta get it done, so it doesn't matter what the weather is. So here's your, uh, starting from the top, your bubble scope. So that's your spherical lens that's taking photos and sending it to the Raspberry Pi every, every second. It's not, nothing, nothing big here except that each node doesn't know where the problem is. That's why I wanted a panoramic photo. So I found a, a solution with a, that was open source. Um, so once again, yeah, you receive GPS, you transmit it out, you receive that with anything in the air, which is this translated jammer, and then you transmit the whole thing back out the, the dedicated backhaul and your Yagi for Wi-Fi control, that's just to, to set everything up. And then you receive all the uh, signals in the X300 with four DDCs, so I went in there, I had to do a hack job to get it, the driver to work, the, uh, the FPGA to work, and to meet timing, and all kinds of fun stuff that we all like to do. And uh, the only thing at this point that I wanna mention is that uh, I, used, I used to make this type of equipment long ago in the mid-2000s, uh, RF to 10 gigabit ethernet, and Linux doesn't like full bandwidth 10 gigabit ethernet, so I found, thanks to our friends at CERN, uh, PF ring, I recommend you guys use it if you want. It's a kernel ring buffer that uh, works out of the box, and uh, it'll help you not drop samples. And with this complexity, I, that's the last thing I wanted to do, drop samples. So the one thing that you can notice here is that the system also upconverts. So we could, and I did test, the hardware is so linear and so out of this world in my mind that I could receive the GPS that was sensed from all the sensing nodes and replay it back at the received node. And so I could play that back and I could see that the GPS is good or not with the, the GPS receiver uh, type of uh, CSAC configuration. So that's not in the demo, but I was impressed that that was even, that that worked. So this is what the processing node looked like. That's the 27 megahertz antenna we're about to set up. I believe we're using the roof as the ground plane. It's madness, HF stuff. And uh, this is one thing I didn't talk about. So here, just receiving antenna, standard stuff. This is a, a 2.4, just a Wi-Fi Yagi pointed to my office. So it's one kilometer away on the roof of a three-story building and the wires connected to my computer. So I had full control of the system. And uh, I would set it up and then I would literally jump in my van and drive around and come back and see what, what happened. So this is an example of the calibration as everyone mentioned before. So the transmitter, I was able to use a certain sensing node to transmit, the other guys receive, okay, what's the difference, correlating, and where you should be. So then you get these empirical values where at five megahertz bandwidth each, as was mentioned before, in my case it was 60 meters about, or 65 yards was the accuracy of the correlator, correlations, which we'll see how I managed to fine tune that shortly. So yeah, you get empirical values and then you plug them into the system of equations and it's good when the rest of the equations actually work and you get a, a consistent set of, of equations. So that was the basic calibration. And so what you're about to see here is a demonstration live, me driving around, um, around a track. So we are located close beside a provincial park. We have acres of land, and we have a huge track in the back uh, where that uh, sensing nodes were, were laid out. So the caution symbol that's yellow is the actual GPS, I should say translated jammer here, that's true position. The square with the star is where we think it is, and then the blue square is just, it misleads people, it's the actual track and then the, the other things are just the nodes, so. 
Here's one thing just before we start is uh, due to that uh, 60 meter uh, uh, accuracy because of the five megahertz bandwidth, uh, the raw signal processing results look like this. So you get, you get multiple ambiguities because we'll see the, uh, the hyperbolas of the TDOA, which is what you're doing. You get hyperbolas and where they intersect is the, uh, the geolocation of a, uh, thing. And so here, uh, the first uh, attempt at this was to just uh, cluster. Whichever points were closer together, I said, okay, let's make them green and say that's good, and the white ones, uh, not so good, but it's just a clustering mechanism. So with this, I presented to my senior management who said, no, this is not good enough. You need something cleaner. You can't show people this. It's too much of an engineering job. So then I uh, discovered, spent some time banging my head, discovered an open source project called OSRM. Open Street Route Map. So uh, these guys have published uh, a, uh, a routing engine that your GPS uses. So literally I use that to snap the values to the road. So in there you can actually find a, so the first thing is you would use the previous method and say, hey, it looks like it's following the road. And then you would say, okay, let's try this snap to the road filter. And using their engine, they're able to push the uh, actual uh, points to the closest road. And then all you need to, all we did tell it was say no U-turns. That's the only thing we were saying. You, you track the route and just say no U-turns and we would take the, the point that's closest to the road. So with that, I'm going to show what the whole thing looks like together. So this is where I work. Um, this is uh, the T21 is the processing node that you saw. Node A is one sensing node that's wired in. Node D, uh, that's about 500 meters away, uh, is just a sensing node. That's another sensing node. And so is node C, which is about 200 or so meters away. So that's the iGeoLock, the interference geolocation that has the cameras. So these are the cameras on the nodes. Um, in the middle, you have the spectrum analyzer which help to debug things, and that's located at T21, and you'll have the backhaul for node A, uh, B, C, and D con uh, in five megahertz chunks. And what you see on what I'm highlighting here on the right of the spectrum analyzer, that's the actual translated GPS jammer. And since the spectrum analyzer is at T21, you'll see things go up and down relative to the distance. So, um, And on the right here is the uh, GPS aware that uh, will flag if the GPS is actually going out or not. So, and I'll get to that in a sec. So here we go. So there's the uh, actual position of the jammer and there's where we think it is, the square behind it. So the GPS aware is actually finding it. It actually tripped off the, uh, it said it was a five nanosecond error. So it picked up that there was a problem and the GPS levels were good. And that's 250 meters away. And here the uh, GPS jammer, uh, the translator jammer I should say, is de decreasing power as we go away from T21. So I'm playing this back in standard time. I'm not speeding it up yet. I'll speed it up later in the interest of time. Um, there, so there, we're bang on. That's thanks to the push or, or push to the snap to the road. There are occasions when the GPS, or there is no report such as this, that just means that everything got thrown out and there was no um, confidence in the results. So the blue track, once again, is just the, where the van's going. And you'll see, so A, B, C, so the other thing I didn't mention is that there are tons of trees here. For node B to go to A, that's going through a whack load of trees. The backhaul was hard to make. And essentially water absorbs RF and you got water in the leaves of the trees. And so I noticed before when we were in middle, uh, early spring, things were a lot better. After we got into the summer, things were in bloom. So what you see here is that we've lost Wi-Fi. We don't know where the van is, but our geolocation does because it can pick up the jammer. 
So that's a, a good uh, sense that things are working. And we're going to see the cameras working shortly. And if you look close, you might see me wave. So there on node D, a van was spotted roughly in the same position. So once again, this is a, the backhaul is real time, continuously streaming. The processing is capturing data, and it takes about 6 to 20 seconds to process that data. And we'll see how we'll process it in a sec. I'm going to speed it up here. Um, just showing that the tracking is still going. And one thing I should mention is that the jamming signal of a jammer is pretty dirty. I'm doing a blind correlation. Um, and because it's so dirty and not clean and cheap, it does correlate well and it does produce a nice peak. I first started this with an actual uh, high-end, uh, nice uh, CW SIG gen, and that doesn't correlate very well. And it gets lobes that spread across. So people who reserve the right to actively jam, such as the President's Limousine and A1 and Humvees in the Middle East, uh, as long as they're jamming, nice, clean, military-grade signals, the, this can't pick it up. So here there was a delay on when the uh, jammer was picked up. Uh, the, the levels dropped. Uh, that red GPS status is only looking at the pulse per second. There's a, there's a nice oscillator that stays nice and stable, even if it loses GPS. So, so back to... So then I decided to have some fun, because at this point it wasn't enough fun just having my office wired, driving around, and getting all this done. So I wanted to know how far did this work. So I've seen military people with hot maps showing that within the, uh, the area of the four nodes, that's the best. So I, they were telling me I should drive my car in there, but there was no way to do it. So I wanted to go all the way around and see how sensitive this thing was on the outside. And I was surprised. I only did this run twice. And uh, this is an example of also the debug tool. So um, the algorithm would shoot out KMLs uh, to Google Earth, and uh, here there's an example of telling me that nodes A, D, C, D, those are the nodes involved. So D is the furthest node, and it's about 1.4 kilometers or 0.87 miles away, and that's where the jammer was on the on-ramp to that road. So, and that was done if the data time was 52 seconds and the display time is 56. So it took four seconds to calculate that, mainly because there was nothing else. There was no other good uh, combination, so they didn't have much to calculate, but yeah, when I saw that, that was pretty amazing. So right here as well, I'm just showing you this because the trees here, it's a full-on deer live in, that tr in those trees. It's, it's pitch black, it's dark. The fact that it even propagates through. Um, the one thing I should tell you is that the demo that you saw was a 200 milliwatt jammer. Typically, jammers will be at 150 milliwatts, so really weak. Here, I did crank it up to as much as I had, which is 1.2 watt. But uh, even uh, down here on the far side, so this was a snap to the road uh, filter that I had on, and the jammer was up here, and I was detecting something a bit further ahead, but the furthest node is one kilometer away. So this is just a testament uh, to the linearity of the hardware, and the TDOA algorithm, the geometries are just crap at this level, as my algorithms guys say. You've got to make an, an issue. The geometries here shouldn't work. The tails of a hyperbola, when they become really close together, it's really hard to tell where does it exactly cross. And so he even saw this and said, we're in business. So out here, there's uh, ambiguity. We'll see why that is. But uh, once again, 1.3 kilometers away. And this is through the worst propagational path you could ever want. So this is an example, just to put everything into context, because I do a lot of presentations to non-technical people who understand money, but not other things. and. Uh, Here's an example of a system that exists that NavCan was considering uh, to go with, and they, uh, it's a signal sentry. And uh, they have eight nodes here, and they have a car going down the middle, uh, and it's about 20 miles uh, uh, away. Um, 20 miles uh, is the legend. So this system here, apparently you need an NDA to, uh, to, to sign to figure out how much it costs, but it's in the millions of dollars. And what, we have, what I just showed you there was uh, less than 50K. American. So the results are the interference geolock and route, uh, track the route of a mobile 200 milliwatt jammer on a four sensing nodes, 
covering about uh, 450 yards by 300 yards with a 10 second delay, up to 20 meter error, that's a bit conservative, and uh, we can track the position further away, uh, some detections up to 0.87 miles. So novel achievement, there are no waveform assumptions, we don't know anything, if it correlates well, use it. No time stamping, because we can't, we don't have GPS. Local reference comes in with the PLL from the V200 to save the day. Uh, small data sets, we're only looking at 10 megabytes uh, and correlating across it. Uh, less than 30 seconds to calibrate with the uh, type of calibration we've spoken of where uh, the white noise gets generated. Uh, four to 20 seconds to geolocate and the snap to the road filter as you've seen. And uh, 4K uh, per sensing node and about 15K for processing node. And the GPS aware box that uses the uh, has an atomic clock but uses its phase detector is uh, 4K per box and uh, it measures the actual uh, error. And yeah, so I'm gonna hopefully quickly go through this uh, as some of it's been spoken about. Um, the cross-correlation and processing, so as was mentioned before, I'm just constantly cross-correlating. Now what I'm doing that makes this work, and this is the only trick that would have, if this didn't, if this didn't work, because we initially did um, USB sticks, we just did spot points, okay, collect data, see if we get anything. So we do collect uh, 200, uh, two, 256,000 uh, complex uh, samples, uh, and that allows us to use a stationary assumption uh, that the car is not moving. Um, we, so this is the trick here, the overlapped cross-correlations of multiples of 8K blocks of complex samples. So I got this idea from windowed overlap FFT, if some of you are familiar with that, I just decided to apply it to the, uh, the output of a correlation. And so literally that's pulling the signal out of the noise and it's giving me more correlation outputs. So that was, we did that with uh, static data and that was found to work and we just ran with it. Why 8K? I couldn't tell you, it, it worst worked. Um, five megahertz, as we've seen, it allows us for a 65 yard precision. So these are the type of correlation peaks we're getting. Uh, pretty nice peak, they're in the bin, everything looks happy. Um, Mode filtering, so as I said, we use those 8K, uh, blocks of 8K across the 256,000 points. Um, the true correlation peak uh, should be more common than the noise. So effectively here, I'm saying that the, the delay should occur 70% of the time across, you know, the, the same delay should occur across all these correlations. If it doesn't occur more than 70% of the time, then don't use it. So essentially the mode, the common thing that you see, that's what I use to filter out. Um, lots of noise. So multipath, everybody loves to talk about multipath, I've discovered. Um, I just treat it brute force way. Uh, pretty much, I can only handle two peaks. If, you, if I have three, I'll throw the whole thing out. Uh, my noise level is just two thirds the amplitude of the previous. So if there's a drop in, in peaks and it's the previous peak in, a, in descending order is two thirds above you, then you are the noise level. So, yeah, that's pretty much it. A lot of data gets thrown out, as we'll see in a slide. Um, parabolic, standard parabolic interpolation to uh, fine tune. So this is the, these are the kind of multipath uh, mess that I get. Um, yeah. Uh, I guess the one thing I forgot to say about multipath is the peak with the least delay. So if there are two peaks, I'll take the peaks with the, with the least delay, as in assuming that that was the peak that made it the direct, the fastest wave, so it must have been the, the fastest or the direct path and not the reflected multipath. So this is what uh, hyperbolic uh, uh, geolocation looks like, and this is why we get multiple points. So these are different nodes. These are the delays, you get this hyper, uh, hyperbola, and it's the intersection of the hyperbolas. So you see here the hyperbolas don't intersect at a magic point, it's multiple points. That's why you get ambiguities. Um, so now to the geolocation side, so the Bancroft algorithm for GPS is what we use. Uh, essentially, it's an uh, uh, analytic solution. Uh, on the early, in the early days, they did an iterative solution to find it, and Bancroft spent, I believe, most of his career trying to figure this out and got it done. And uh, the interesting thing here is that, uh, yeah, if you ever come across the Lorentz transform here, they use it twice. I was blown away that this would work, but it does and we use it every day in all of our devices. So the whole point here is that GPS obviously gives you altitude. We uh, convert it, we don't get altitude, we just uh, do X, Y. We tried to get altitude, but we didn't have enough uh, uh, sensors that would report at the same time. So we believe that was our problem. 
So here, um, yeah, we invert the problem. So when they first made GPS, they, had, uh, they didn't have satellites in the air, they had them on the ground. And the plane would fly by and they'd just try to track the plane. So here we try to, to, to do the same thing. We, our nodes are listening and the jammer is what's driving around. So here it's the jammer pseudo range that we're looking at. So yeah, that's uh, the fast geolocation. So filtering recap, what gets thrown out? Uh, mode, so we take the mode of all the cross correlations. Uh, if it's less than 70%, then we throw it out. Multipath, two or more peaks, forget about it. Bancroft, uh, if Bancroft's not happy, then there's no solution, then it doesn't go anywhere, and snap to the road if we're using that filter, and uh, it says it can't route that point, or there's no, uh, yeah, there's no route. Uh, once you push it to the road, then it says, nope, it'll throw it out as well. So that's why you sometimes see there's no geolocation. Future optimization, uh, overcome the backhaul with a uh, limitation of the five megahertz uh, dedication with sped spectrum. So possibly I did try initially to use 20 megahertz and try to overlap them and try to do some madness, but there was no time and uh, it, yeah. Uh, upgrade the uh, SBX in the X300 with the uh, twin uh, as a super het would probably have better sensitivity. And the, the cross correlation we're using right now is Intel IPP, which is not open. So it'd be nice to find an open alternative that would be as fast, or we might not need to do 256,000 point correlations either. That's kind of expensive. So recognition, this is the team, uh, two wire, uh, wireless tech, a uh, scientist, and another tech who did the rest of the uh, work and everything that's not listed, I did. And it took us a year to do this, thanks to Edis Research, who past and present employees have put all this stuff together so we don't have to do it every time and that's what they used to do at my research lab and most research labs, reinvent the wheel. And the open source community, uh, OSRM like I mentioned, open street route map, uh, PF ring for the kernel ring buffer bubble scope for the guy who mapped the panoramic uh, spherical lens into a, a nice photo and the new radio um, which we did use along the way such as exploring if DVBT would be a good backhaul and whatnot. So. Thank you very much, and have a seat. And there is a link here. I have published this before, mainly more on the algorithm side, less on the hardware side. Well, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, questions for the speaker? I'm curious uh, what your thought process was to come up with the architecture to backhaul the signals to that one place before you captured them all together rather than capturing them at the initial receiving points and then bringing the data together in, in a non-real-time way and then doing the TDOA. Because we wanted, uh, it had to be cheap, so the cost was a driving factor, and it, we wanted it as real-time as possible. So. And the other thought process was, well, the signal comes from the GPS, uh, from the satellite in BPSK, so why am I reinventing a modulation? Why not just let it continue on? So, which is effectively what we're doing, right? We're just translating that band. So I said, lots of work has been done. It's got from me in mid-Earth orbit. It just has 500 meters to go. <laughs> Don't touch it. That took a lot of thinking and a lot of realizing. And usually when you get to the point where keep it simple, stupid, you're at the right answer. And it worked. So. Other questions? Well, thank you very much. Thank you.